Um, this could go a lot of different directions, um, and I probably prepared um, two different ones in one slide deck, which will just make this really interesting. Um, but um, uh, so for, to help me kind of navigate where we're going to go, how many of you have collected network data? How many of you have designs on collecting network data? How many of you just use other people's network data? All of them are useful. Yes. That's where I got my start. Um, and the, the reason I think, the, the way I'm gonna think about this is kind of practicalities of collecting data. I often couple that with evaluating uh, network data and I think it's as important to evaluate network data that you're using that's your own and is other people's. And I think those things really get tied into how we consider the approach of how data are or were or will be collected. So um, the reason I asked those questions is uh, I was trying to figure out how I'm gonna balance where we're gonna go and it looks like I should try and do both of my talks simultaneously. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so um, traditionally, a lot of the times when we talk about network data collection, we have a tendency to think in quote unquote standard social scientific practice mode and then adapt it to the network context. And you've, if, you aren't, um, if you weren't previously kind of already aware of this, um, there's some big problems there because we're fundamentally working with relational orientations which really just don't net neatly kind of translate from individually oriented or, or collectively oriented practices. All that to say, um, oftentimes when we talk about these sorts of things, we then kind of proceed in, in a manner that just kind of follows that adaptation. So we think about sampling, how do we adapt sampling to networks? We think about measurement, how do we adapt that measurement to networks and so forth and so on. I'm gonna try and avoid that a little bit today. If you would have preferred that style, there's lots of those out there. Chapter version, there's a book by some guy who, uh, in the Sage series, um, that, that does exactly that. So I'm not saying it's a terrible approach because I've done it myself. Um, but I think I'm gonna take a slightly different approach today and think uh, a little bit more about kind of the, um, the premises and orientations to this, the kind of modalities that we would take to collect network data. And then I'm gonna try and illustrate some of these points of kind of more standard practices along the way. Um, Hopefully that's an okay choice. We'll see how it goes. Um, so I'm gonna focus largely from an organization of these kind of uh, perspectives that comes from a chapter that Miranda Lubbers and I um, wrote a couple of years ago now on kind of modalities of network data collection, thinking about separately surveys where a lot of the kind of evaluation of network data comes from, um, experiments, observations, and then kind of more breadcrumby type data. Um, and I'm going to extract out of some of that a, a variety of practical considerations that, like I said, would often be the way that this kind of presentation would be organized. I'm gonna have those kind of more the secondary, but we'll, we'll hope that works out okay. Um, and I can't not talk about ethical things um, when I'm talking about with anything when it comes to networks. Um, and I'll have to put a, put a big caveat on that at the end. But um, so we're gonna, like I said, kind of orient the, the discussion here around thinking about um, kind of four primary strategies for collecting and having network data um, that we um, had a really good label for one set where we can think about kind of the di differentiation between data that come from active participants, so people who are doing something um, to provide the data that you have um, versus going about their daily life and kind of we're kind of um, get gathering information um, as they do so where the participants in your, in your research are more passively in engaged in the research process. Um, I still don't know what goes on the y-axis here. I've talked about this as though it's like um, large n and small n logics, but I'm oversimplifying when I say that, so I'm not sure that that actually holds. Um, that doesn't much matter. Um, but what I'm, the reason I'm gonna talk about these in this kind of orientation is each one of these are primed, let me go back for a second, each one of these are more primed for answering different types of questions than others. None of them are universally good, none of them are universally bad. They all do very different things well and different things poorly. Um, and so I wanna think in the network context of what we can leverage out of these as we kind of go forward. Um, that's going to be the idea. Um, so Matt Brashears um, and Eric Gladstone uh, published a chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Social Networks that um, Jim was one of the editors of, um, where they talked about kind of experimental approaches um, to, thinking of, to, to thinking in networks. And one of the things that we often kind of um, recognize about experiments is there's things about them that are kind of trade-offs between um, more kind of naturalistic sorts of things versus more controlled sorts of things. Um, which also have trade-offs in terms of generalizability. And that's no different in the network context than it is outside of the network context. It's just the types of things that are generalizable and the types of things that are more controllable are slightly different in the network context than in studying other sorts of things. And so in particular, one of the ways I like to think about this is thinking about what is it that we're trying to 
explain. If we, if we assume that we have kind of causal orientations, right, there are two fundamental different ways we could be thinking about explanation when we're, when we're um, doing experiments. One is the, on the network side, um, like how do ties form? How do ties dissolve? Which ties are there? Which ties are not there? And this kind of comes in the classic like social exchange literature and lots of other types of um, experimental work is out there that's done uh, a ton of work on this. Alternatively, we could think about the network as the kind of means by which things spread or Hap or, or the, the means by which other things happen in our population, and we might study instead of the changes of the network, how other things change over top of the network, right? Um, and each one of these have really different kind of implications, um, but I just want to point out that in the, in the experimental kind of conditions for, uh, for working with networks, um, we, ha we can have both of these sets of questions. I'm gonna skip past this slide a little bit, but one of the reasons that I think, I, I will mention it briefly, one of the reasons that I think this is particularly compelling um, for experimental work is that we can get a lot out of kind of uh, out of this type of work on mechanisms that we often can't out of other sorts of data, right? So we can kind of figure out why things work the way they work um, in a kind of classical challenge to the social sciences from Coleman from a long time ago, um, both in terms of things like um, aggregating mechanisms, but also in terms of things like moderation and mediation um, sorts of processes on other sorts of patterns that we observe. Um, so all that to say, experiments are really useful for getting at kind of controlled things, um, process things, um, and other sorts of questions that some of the other data types that we have here really aren't as um, well equipped for. So what are some of the things that have happened here um, in this kind of space um, uh, in, in networks? Um, uh, like I was saying, um, one of the things that's happened a lot is that um, people have used experiments to think about kind of what ties can we kind of um, uh, enhance the likelihood of, of them forming or not um, so that we can kind of get out some of these questions of what like network structure looks like and how that associates with various attributes um, to discern some things about mechanisms. Um, the, the caveat for experimental designs um, uh, often in, in network, in, in most contexts, not just in network contexts, is kind of this question about external validity. Um, and the, something that's been particularly striking in some of the network experimental work that's happened over the last several decades is we've often found that things that look very solid in observational studies are hard to replicate in experimental studies. Um, if you've never read um, uh, Lisa Berkman's kind of line of work, it's, it's just fascinating to kind of see what held up and what didn't across studies of how network change and uh, post-stroke and post-myocardial um, uh, infarction uh, uh, survival rates differed um, and how much of that was intervenable to improve outcomes and how much of it wasn't. Um, all that to say, um, I, think, I think these things all need to happen in concert with one another um, so that we can kind of really learn what's going on from them. Um, I think I'm going to not go into too much depth there, um, other than to say one thing that I'm going to try and do as I kind of talk through this is some things that um, have either been particularly well leveraged in some of these kind of frameworks for data collection um, or not so much or things that I see as potential opportunities. And I'll say these potential opportunities are really just my kind of um, soapboxes a little bit more than they are um, kind of universal uh, expectations. But uh, I think in the, in the network context, we, we have particularly in kind of the exchange literature, we've, we've relied on lab experiments a lot. Um, the kind of role of natural experiments on networks has been a little less um, uh, kind of used, um, but I think there's an opportunity there. Um, we've seen a move towards online experimentation in really useful ways. Uh, David Santola's work looking at kind of health, how, how health kind of behaviors and health um, interventions are kind of um, designable and implementable, and we've learned a lot of things about how that translates both uh, from online behaviors into offline as well. Um, one of the things that I um, am, I think, particularly as we have moved into kind of online experimental conditions and um, kind of large-scale experimental conditions in the network world, I think we have an opportunity to do, is networks often are studies of single context at a time. Right, and so, um, and, and there's good reason for that, but there's also a lot that we don't know that we, what we're getting out of that. Um, is this very particular to that context or is this something that would hold up across other places? And so I think um, one thing that we have the opportunity to do um, either in data or I've done some on, on, of our own work in kind of simulation worlds um, uh, of uh, empirical context to think about how kind of the variation of context might lead to different outcomes than what we see when we study kind of one organization, one organization, one population, et cetera, at a time. Um, I think experiments are an interesting place to be able to do this um, in particular. 
Um, so I, I kind of skip past the experimental, I, I go through the experimental piece a little bit quickly because one, it's not as common in networks as it might, as some of the others are. Um, that said, it is very, it, it has been used a lot. Um, there's a lot of it we can, um, there's a lot we can learn from it. And two, a lot of the other strategies as they have been developed have been developed in ways to optimize the weaknesses of network, of, of experimental conditions. What can we do better in other ways, right? And so this is what you're gonna see is some of these others are almost kind of responses to, can we do this? Can, can we get better data um, via other strategies? Um, and so what I'm gonna start with um, is kind of where we saw kind of most of early work um, as our next is, I'm gonna to move to observational um, uh, network data. And when I talk about observational, I mean this um, in the sense of I'm watching somebody do something and I'm using that to then record data, right? And there's lots of, and I'm, I'm using kind of vague terms intentionally here because this could be anything from like ethnographic work. It could be kind of very systematic social observation sorts of work. But the idea is that people are going about their everyday lives and you're doing something to, to get information about that that you're encoding in a network way. Elizabeth Bott did some kind of great work on this in families that she combined with interview data. Um, to, a little, to get us kind of thinking about how, network, how family network structures impact kind of outcomes across generations and for a long time. We also have, there are lots of different data collection going on in the bank wiring room data, but one of them was a set of observational data looking at how people actually inter interacted across their work days. I don't know if you all are familiar with this data. How many of you know the Roth's I, I know you do, Jim, thanks. Uh, <laughs> um, these are data from was it the 30s, 20s, 30s, somewhere in there, um, that was looking at how uh, 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 a bank wiring room, how people interacted in there, things like gameplay, um, who they talked to, who they talked to, who they reported as their friends, and one of the ties that was particularly kind of interesting in this one was who had fights over which windows were left open versus closed. Um, um, so like there were lots of different relational data, some of which was observational and some of which was um, survey elicited, but the idea here is that most of the things that we're talking about aren't new in the network context, um, we just kind of deployed them slightly differently today. One of the ways that these types of things have become more kind of um, developed in slightly different ways are more system systematization um, strategies of how we collect observational data. So this is um, from some work from some colleagues of mine when I was at Arizona State, um, where they were studying the networks amongst preschoolers, and they wanted to study how kind of preschoolers form their friendship groups across uh, school years, and they literally had uh, grad students sitting on tablets where they were coding kind of what kids were in what spaces and who were facing whom and who were playing with whom and who were doing various things in ways that could be thought of as kind of engaging with others, and they had that coded a lot of different ways, and it was done on kind of micro um, momentary assessments where they um, had, I forget what the, what the time frame was, but every like 10 seconds or something, they were supposed to kind of switch their focal kid to another kid, and then they would kind of record what was going on around them. So you could get really systematic kind of observations of what's going on in this, and the, the interface is a little old, but that's because I was at ASU. Yeah, a few years ago now, um, but, it, it, but it, it helped them be able to study things like emerging network structure amongst preschoolers, and they actually found that preschoolers tended towards uh, increased triadic closure in their friend groups as the school year progressed. I'm talking three and four year olds. Some of the things we're talking about here kind of get very kind of encoded very early, and, and we start to follow kind of expected patterns. Um, and moreover, it happened. Um, increasingly as the school year went on. So kids seem to be learning these expectations, not just kind of following them. Anyway, sorry, I think it's a cool example. Um, and we can do all kinds of kind of things with this. This is from an old visualization paper. I forgot that you were on this. I remember this is Dan's, Dan's data. Um, that, um, they, they had like cameras in classrooms and they were encoding, they were watching um, and encoding up kind of uh, who asked questions of whom, who talked to whom, and all kinds of things across the classroom you see kind of the different types of data, uh, different types of ties coded here. But one of the things that is nice about these sorts of things is you can get kind of pictures of dynamic um, processes quite easily from observations. Um, and that's one of the things that I think um, is particularly compelling about observational data is it's much better at capturing processes um, than often are things like surveys or experiments, right? So we can see what's going on in practice. Um, and um, it also has the kind of trade-off, as we often think about from experiments, of being more realistic and naturalistic. Um, but like I said, I think the dynamics and the kind of processes um, versus kind of um, represented patterns is, is one of the biggest strengths here. Um, 
how, how, how much of this can we do is definitely a limitation, um, and how we systematize these things is another thing, but we've seen a lot of kind of pushes in this direction, um, both for networks and for non-networks. I'm missing something, oh, there we go. Um, one thing that has happened um, that I think is particularly kind of a useful adaptation is what I was showing one example of as, as how these kind of observational sampling strategies and measurement strategies have become increasingly digitized, making those data kind of more useful in the back end um, more quickly, um, which we'll see another example in surveys um, later that I'll talk about and you'll hear about more tomorrow. Um, but I also think this is another kind of place you'll, you'll hear me kind of um, on my soapbox a little bit about comparative opportunities because I think networks, again, we have this tendency to do things um, in small contexts and, and assume they kind of carry over. Um, being able to do these things in multiple contexts I think would be an advantage. Um, so hard shift to a different kind of strategy. Um, of data collection, and this is, we're going to think a little bit about survey network data collection. And so if, uh, uh, if you read kind of ex uh, existing kind of um, chapters on network data collection and how we kind of think about sampling and how we think about measurement, we often assume surveys are your kind of bread and butter and everything else kind of follows from that. I would argue that that's to some degree useful, um, and most of the things that we need to consider when it comes to networks um, in the survey context do apply elsewhere. So things like the boundary specification problem, which I'll talk about in a second if that doesn't mean anything to you yet, um, is something that matters for surveys, but it also matters for other kind of uh, other types of data collection as well. I would argue though that there are some things that are very particular to surveys that make um, them a little less, um, there, there are things that are necessary for consideration in other types of data collection that are not as well um, represented in surveys. And so I don't think that we can just kind of start with surveys and say, oh, you have to do all these things elsewhere as well. You, you, I think we have to think about them as collections. And it's best to think about them um, in, in kind of um, their constellation and kind of what each type of data collection is best, it is most useful for what types of questions. But um, this is probably I think I can say this is probably the most used single network um, uh, data collection instrument that exists. Um, this is what's known as the important matters name generator question from the General Social Survey, um, where basically they asked um, people to tell um, who their five, who, who, um, people, who they talked to in the last six months about important matters, um, and um, then they followed up with a variety of types of questions, and this has been adapted all kinds of ways, and I'll have some comments on that in just a second. Um, but the basic idea here is that we're trying to get at something about who are in each other's kind of important network circles. Um, surveys also go back to kind of our earliest history in networks. Um, this, is a, a, this is one of the papers, um, one of my favorite papers actually from Jacob Moreno and Hal Jennings, um, where they uh, were looking at um, uh, a, a, school, a school context. Um, one of the reasons I love this paper is like the way we think about ergoms today, they were actually trying to like figure out um, in this paper um, in ways that is just mind blowing um, to me where they were trying to figure out what random expectations would have been and how what they were observing differed from random expectations. Um, and they were like generating statistics that were approximating what we do today. But anyway, the point, that's not the point of this. The point of this is that surveys are, are, are very foundational to us. There's lots of ways we can collect survey data. Um, I will talk about a few things in, in, in a little bit, um, but this is, um, you, and you're not intended to be able to read this, this is, um, you remember like Scantron booklets, we use, uh, some of us will, some of us won't in this room. Um, Scantron booklets are the way AdHealth actually collected their data where they literally kind of coded in bubbles for their friends and for their various uh, data st statistics and that. Um, but the reason I, I have it here is basically to, to, to talk about um, what I heard Jim talking about when I, when I was coming in is the first thing they ask is kind of who are your friends, right? And in Ad Health, um, they were able to nominate up to five male and female friends. Um, but then when we collect network data, we often then follow that up with what we, 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 we excuse me, let me back up. We refer to this as our name generator question, right? So who are, what, who are we collecting relationship information about? In Ad Health, it was friends. Um, in other sorts of contexts, it could be any number of other things. But on top of name generator questions, when we're collecting network data, we almost always follow that up with a variety of what we refer to as interpreter questions. Um, and I don't, uh, some people would refer to these as name interpreter questions because, um, and that's important because often we're asking people about the attributes of the alters that they nominated, right? So you name somebody, can you tell me their age? Can you tell me their gender? Can you tell me their race? So forth and so on. There are other interpreter questions though as well that are more kind of relational interpreter questions. So about the tie rather than about the person. 
right? So how frequently do you, do you see this person? How often do you talk to them? How important are they in your life, et cetera? So these interpreter questions often become kind of a second layer um, in the way that we elicit information about um, each uh, person that is nominated. And that's true whether you're studying in an e egocentric or complete network design, which I'll come back to in a second as well. Um, and usually when we're kind of asking people questions about networks, not, not always, but often, we also have a kind of third step in these where those relational interpreters can move beyond you and your friends, but then it can ask about your friend's friends, right? So if I've named, if I've named two people, I might ask my survey respondents also, do they know each other? How well do they know each other? How much do they interact? And one reason you might do that is in a lot of contexts, those people might not be part of your survey. So being able to get some things about like network closure or network density require you to get it from the person, from a focal person rather than assuming you can get it from a complete um, design, which I'll look back to, like I said, in a second. Um, so we did some of that in, this is data from Malawi where we were um, thinking about uh, who, ta who talks to whom about HIV related things and then we asked questions about do those people also talk to each other about HIV related things, um, for example. Some adaptations in the survey context that I think are particularly kind of beneficial here um, is there's been a, a push um, and I, I, I like to point out that some of these very recent pushes aren't in any way new. Um, they're just done better in some ways. So using visualization to collect network data is something we've done for a long time. Um, so not just visualizing it after it, but using it as we collect data. This is like an old version of where people literally had like paper and they were sticking stickies on the paper of saying like, who are your friends? And they could rearrange them and draw lines between them and do all these sorts of things about naming your people, getting characteristics of them, then getting characteristics of their friends, I mean, of the relationship um, in, the, in the data collection process. I'm not gonna talk too much, and yeah, I even deleted the slide. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about Network Canvas because you have a session on this tomorrow, um, but that is one of the platforms that basically has taken this and made it digitized and gives you the data kind of in analyzable form right out the back end um, in really useful ways. But I just think that one of the reasons that people engage in using these kind of visualization practices in collecting data is network data collection is taxing on respondents. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, um, it's costly, and so things that we can do to improve the process um, for in just terms of enjoyment, in terms of getting it done quicker, um, can result in much higher quality data. And visualization has been shown to do that because people, well, we're self-interested, we like to see our, our, our networks in front of us, it's kind of fun for people, but also it, it, believe it or not, can speed up the process in a number of ways too, because instead of asking one question 10 times, you can ask one question and then kind of rearrange things on the page as you go. And so there, there, while it seems like it's just something that is kind of, um, uh, it, it might be, it, it, well, it may seem that this is not particularly um, uh, strategic, um, that it's just kind of, doing something um, to make it more enjoyable, it actually has a, a strong impact on the quality of data as well. So surveys, um, sorry, this is stepping in weird. Um, surveys allow us to systematize what we're measuring. Um, I'll loop back, yeah, no, I'm not gonna do that now. I'll loop back in a second to talk about some things. I think that's a useful thing. Um, it can um, counter, it can have kind of countervailing um, goals of if you're in an egocentric um, network context, how much have, have you all talked about kind of egocentric versus complete networks a little bit? Okay, I'll elaborate that in about three slides if you're still puzzled what I'm talking about. Um, the breadth, breadth uh, in, in ego network designs, you can kind of get large populations and study them quite well. In complete network designs, you can often kind of get a complete, a, a more composite picture of single populations, which I think um, are both useful for different types of things. Um, a very kind of big strength of um, survey data is that it gives you people's perceptions of their networks, right? So this is telling us something about what people perceive to be going on around them, which is we know to be very informative about social processes. One of the biggest limitations of survey data is that it is gi giving you the perceptions of people's relationships, right? Whether or not this is what you want or whether or not it is not is often determined by the question. So I kind of cut my teeth in the network world studying things like um, se sexual partnerships and needle sharing partnerships and how that leads to um, the likelihood of transmitting HIV or other STIs, right? And in that context, perceptions aren't really what matters, the behaviors are what matter. But in other contexts, what I'm studying a lot of these days is how behaviors spread or ideas or attitudes spread through populations. Sometimes the perceptions matter more than the reality on those sorts of ties. And so um, this can be a double-edged sword. 
um, and there's no kind of um, single answer here that what you need is a more precise measure of exactly the type of friend, uh, the, the type of relationship that, that you think matters here, because sometimes that is exactly what you need, and sometimes it's exactly what you don't for, some, for certain types of questions. And this is where, unfortunately, when I give talks about network data collection, often my answer is, and it depends, you know, when people are asking what the best strategy is, and it really depends on your question. So perceptions, I, 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 I'm harping on this for just a second, but I think it's, um, I think it's gotten a bad name, um, is, is my point here, is I think sometimes we have assumed that our data are less objective than they need to be, and my point is that I think sometimes the types of data that we need to be able to really understand social processes are what people think their relationships are more than what they really are. Um, so I, I'm, I'll step off with that now. Um, surveys are just costly. Um, it takes, if, if, every time I have fielded network data collection inside a survey, um, people assume that they can get, you know, in you know, very short windows, the amount of things that we would want out of it, uh, out of um, the, the survey. And so if we're talking, when we were collecting data in Malawi, um, our survey was like 28 pages. It took about two, uh, it took about 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And so, you know, we're competing for space and for time on that and adding a little network, a network module, they were like, oh, you can have three minutes. And it's like, what can you do in three minutes? Not a whole lot, right? And so the idea here is that when you have a name generator, a name interpreter, and a relational interpreter, every question you ask compounds into multiple additional questions, right? And so being able to kind of figure out, one, um, what you can do, one, two, what you can do well, and three, how it fits in with everything else that's going on in our, in our research is often kind of a negotiated process. So I would just argue, I, I would just tell you in advance that getting network data is often um, per kind of unit much more costly than other types of data that we collect. Um, some things that have helped, I already mentioned the participant-aided sociograms. Something I think is particularly interesting is when we first started net studying networks in the social sciences, everything was multiplex. Um, we didn't study um, you know, just friendship, or we didn't study just anything one at a time. People were looking at eight different types of ties and thinking about how they interact. And I think um, we've kind of, we're coming, we're coming back to that, I think, in, in useful ways um, to recognize that the ability to measure multiple types of relationships simultaneously in the same population is very important for understanding most of the social processes we're interested in, rather than focusing on singular ones of them at a time. Simple example of this um, from my own work, I had a paper with a, a PhD student recently um, where we looked at data sets on, um, on sexual partnering and data sets on needle sharing. And we thought about these as these are definitely very important things for studying STIs. If you then assume that like the flow of an STI through a population is simply kind of additive across those two types of networks, they're not. And that's what our, what our paper essentially shows is that what, and one reason that we wanted to look at this is it's become very common that you, know, you need to know a lot about drug sharing populations if you want to study them well. And often that kind of comes to the detriment of knowing about sexual partnering in the same population. And so we've seen increasing numbers of data sets that do one or the other of these and assume we're getting at the processes that, that really matter by thinking about how those may combine. But they combine in non, um, non straightforward ways. And I think that's even more so when we're talking about like social processes, right? So friendships, um, animosities, lots of types of relationships can be important set simultaneously rather than just focusing on singulars at a time. Um, something I've been kind of um, coming around to over the last five or six years is I spent a lot of my, um, I spent a lot of early time when I was thinking about collecting network data, assuming what we needed was more precise and more uh, reliable measures of the same kind of objective things that people could report to us. And I am, coming more around to the, the fact that I don't usually know what really matters to the people that I'm studying, um, and it'd be more useful for us to allow the meaning and the importance of some of those ties to, be, to, to emerge from the data collection process rather than to be assumed a priori. So thinking about the meaning of relationships is something that I think we in the network community could spend a fair amount more time doing for what it's worth. Um, where are we on time? Okay. Um, so the last thing, I, the last kind of modality I'm going to talk about are trace data. And trace data can take a lot of different forms, and it's also not a new thing, right? So Stanley Milgram's notion of the six degrees of separation is very much a kind of trace data example, right? So there are people who are sending some package along and trying to get um, a, 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 a simple kind of um, metric of how disconnected or connected a population was. Um, but we're seeing you know, any number of ways that trace data can be used today. Um, 
I, I now am starting to feel like a dinosaur when I use things like this, where um, they, we, we start out, people were using these like moats where you would wear them around your neck and you would take them to meetings and, and um, you could record like who's in, in, in proximity to whom or who's potentially talking to whom. Um, yeah, obviously we can get this off of phones and other things uh, easier now, but this is how this kind of, this, these processes started um, being translated into digital context. Um, but um, uh, there's been a number of things that I think have been useful, particularly useful that have come out of this. Um, this is a paper um, that talks about how those kind of interaction patterns of like physically observable um, interactions from something like a moat compare to people's perceptions of their friendships and um, then, uh, excuse me, people's perceptions of who they interacted with and then who they identify as friends. And you see that there's some ways that those are strongly overlapping and some ways that those are not. And so thinking about those not as kind of different ways to measure the same thing, but different measures of social interactions that are quite different from one another, I think is um, a way we can um, make use of this. These types of data have been then used to see a lot of other things as well. Um, so this is uh, a paper for, from Marcel Salih and, and Jamie Jones where they use some of these kind of uh, in daily interactional data to then ask questions about what a flu epidemic would look like through a population based on the contact patterns in a school and show how clustering patterns shape both the timing, duration, and extent of a flu outbreak in a population. Um, more clustered makes it last longer but reach fewer people. That's the short punchline for what it's worth. Um, um, so these often kind of have kind of large capacity to do lots of different things, um, uh, uh, both in terms of kind of capturing dynamics and, and frequency of um, information. Um, I, I also think they're particularly useful for calibrating uh, models. I think um, some of what Ashton was talking about earlier even does some of this. One of the biggest problems with any types of trace data is that we often don't know how the data were collected and or encoded, right? So the biases that are there, often you have to discover them as you go, um, which sometimes is useful, sometimes, um, <laughs> sometimes it's hard to figure out. Um, and often the kind of, um, what computer scientists would refer to as metadata, what we would refer to as kind of the attribute data that you might want along, alongside these sorts of things is sometimes thin to nil as well. So how you can make use of these um, sometimes is the data may be more kind of uh, big than useful is the way I would say that at times um, is some of the trade-offs. But we're also starting to recognize ways that we can combine trace data with other sorts of data in useful ways with be they administrative data, um, various forms of crosswalks as Jim mentioned. And I got roped into COVID response in Colorado um, uh, uh, for a number of years. Um, and we were basically kind of figuring out ways to use cell phone data and other types of administrative data in ways that were approximating kind of contact behavioral patterns um, in populations in useful ways. And I think thinking about how these things can be usefully combined with others um, is, is an important opportunity. And I'd say, and this isn't surprising to anybody who's worked with this type of data, um, when you're talking about trace data, the key kind of opportunity is figuring out how the heck to validate it. Right? What does it actually represent is a question that we have to be asking our ourselves over and over and over again. So I said um, that I did this in kind of a weird order um, where I might have started, um, particularly piggybacking off of um, action, is we can think about sampling in the network context as simultaneously a problem of like what we, who we want to study, but also how we're going to study it. Um, and so um, if this is our network on the right, how much of it are we interested in capturing might be our question. There's a lot of different potential answers to this question, right? One possibility is we might think about sampling, not individuals, but sampling dyads. And the reason I talk about sampling dyads is if we think that our, trans our, our focus in networks is studying relationships, then I often don't even think that the individual is the unit we should start from, right? The, the relationship is often the, the unit I would like us to start from. Um, and so we could kind of try and figure out ways to sample dyads themselves. Often we can't do that very well, so people do things like egocentric network data instead. When we say egocentric, what we mean is a focal individual, all the ties around them, right? Um, and so this blue node and therefore red ties. Um, and then you notice that we also have some uh, approximation of the ties amongst those. So in ego networks, we could ask them to report on their partner's partners. Um, there are other ways we can collect data um, via subgroups. Maybe there's a population, maybe you're studying a school and you study you know, cl one classroom at a time, 
um, versus multiple classrooms. Um, and there are many ways that people have done this. I would argue, uh, one thing that I've seen happening over the last decade um, that is puzzling to me, to be frank, is um, in school-based st school studies, we're increasingly seeing grade level um, uh, uh, network data collection instead of school level data collection, which I know there's like pragmatic reasons for this, but assuming that those are really hard boundaries between relationships across grades is sometimes um, less um, sustainable than I think uh, the, the, the strategy would, would warrant for what it's worth. Um, but, but we could focus on just studying some subgroups at a time, be the classrooms or others. Um, there are strategies that allow us to start with some seed, like RDS, but we could, we could follow them and study networks. Um, that do kind of some link tracing based approach, right? So we start with some person, the blue person, then we get kind of everybody who's one step removed from them or two steps removed from them or so forth and so on. You'll notice that if I start in this center group, I don't ever get out of it, um, which is potentially problematic, which also leads for the opportunity of studying complete networks. Um, and when we talk about complete networks, we're thinking about some bounded node set and all of the relationships between them. I always put complete in quotes because there's often porous boundaries, um, but. The idea here is that we're trying to study the relationship, the, the census of relationships within a population. The main thing I want to point out here is we, in, in, when we think about um, kind of social science data collection or health and behavioral um, data collection, we often assume that sampling is something we do and then measurement is something we do. In the network context, those two things are intertwined directly with one another. The way we sample is often network oriented. The way we measure things is often a sampling informed question. Um, so these things aren't as separable as may be the case elsewhere. So this leads us to kind of three major strategies for um, sampling in networks. The local or ego network design starts with a single or a sample set of respondents and the people they're connected to gets things about their characteristics and their respondents uh, and their, uh, the relationships they have. Um, the complete network starts the other end, basically assumes that we're gonna start with an entire population and then enumerate everything about the relationships within that population. All right, so this is what Ad Health did. This, the top one is what like, the general social survey did. A lot of our studies exist somewhere in the middle, um, which, which, which is what Martina Morris labeled partial network designs, or some have referred to as kind of link tracing based designs. Um, but the basic idea here is that we're doing something to elicit uh, nominations, and then with each round of nominations, we also recruit some of those into the, the study population as well. Um, useful for things like studying hidden and unknown populations, but that's not the only time they're used. Um, I'm gonna skip this. Um, so this gets put together in ways that ha has uh, been traditionally lab been labeled as what is known as the boundary specification problem, the kind of sampling and measurement question. And what this means is, who are we trying to capture the relationships of is essentially what the boundary specification question is about, right? And so um, uh, the, the, this label first came by, um, uh, first came, um, why am I gonna blank on, Sorry, this, I've reached a point in my life where names just fly out of my brain every once in a while and it'll come back to me in about 30 seconds. Um, Lamine Marson, thank you. Um, so um, um, basically coined this term that basically to, to point out the fact that when we're, when we're gathering network data, um, we have to think about both which nodes and which ties are part of the population that we're actually interested in studying. And those aren't always kind of perfectly overlapping with one another, right? You can have, you can have people who are in your boundary set and they can have ties that go outside of that um, that you may or may not want to um, be, be gathering information about. So the idea here is that boundary specification is a methodological thing, um, but it has assumptions and it has kind of in, in, um, implications for what's going on at the kind of level of the system that you're trying to study. Um, and perhaps um, most, um, most uh, pervasively, this has often been talked about as a thing that can be defined in one of two ways. It can be defined by the researcher, right? So I can say, I care about X population and I don't care about things outside of that population. If I'm studying schools, I'm interested in the relationships in that si inside that school. If I don't get information about the relationships those kids have outside of school, that's beyond my scope, right? That's okay, is the idea of that, that version of the boundary specification problem. The other version of the boundary specification problem says that we're gonna let the participants define kind of what the relevant set is. Um, so maybe we're talking about like clubs um, and participation in clubs and clubs are, you know, they, they, they might have rosters, but are the rosters really a representation of who's engaged in that and who people kind of interact with inside that club? 
Maybe or maybe not. And so if that's the case, then maybe instead of relying on the roster, we're just gonna ask people who's part of the club, right? And so the, the idea here is that the boundary can be specified by those kind of inside the population sometimes better than people outside of it um, a priori. So there are kind of different strategies that this can, this can take. Um, the point, the, the big point here is that the boundary specification problem is often treated as though it is a methodological problem. It is, but that's not all it is. And it might not even be primarily what it is. It's also a theoretical claim about what matters in whatever population you're studying. Um, and, and trying to make a decision about how you're gonna decide which ties to follow um, without um, kind of linking it to the theoretical question um, is, is, I think, a, a bit short-sighted. And this is when I was writing the Sage Little Green book, I had this, uh, this conversation with Jason Boardman multiple times um, where he would read a section. He's like, tell me which of these you want me to do. And I said, I can't if I don't know what your question is. <laughs> um, because sometimes the answer is that you've got to go with an, endogenous, with an internal def defined boundary. And sometimes the answer is you've got to go with an external defined boundary. It really depends on what your question is. Um, and we had that question, conversation not just about this, but about half the book. Um, there's lots of things we can study. There's lots of things we have studied. I'm just gonna put this up here to say, often I think we should be studying more of them simultaneously rather than each of them individually. And I'll move on from that. Um, give me just a second. I've been trying, this is the point at which I didn't know what to, where, where we would go from here, so I'm figuring it out. Okay, so now I know where we'll go from here. Um, so um, there have been a lot of questions about um, what we think we know from what we have gathered information about. This is probably one of the kind of um, most frequently mentioned titles of the paper just because it's kind of goofy. Um, but this was a paper using the, general, using the kind of general social survey important matters prompt and basically asked the population, this was a study done actually in North Carolina, um, they asked people after they had done the important matters um, question, they asked them to kind of tell what it is that they were talking to about important matters. And there's a lot of things that came out of this study, um, and one of which was that one of the important matters somebody was talking about was cloning headless frogs. Um, I don't, no, I don't remember anything beyond that other than that was the topic. Um, and we might say, well, is that really that important, right? Um, we could ask the question of, is important something that is kind of objectively identifiable? Um, and this became kind of a debate, and to some degree, they were, the, this paper suggested that maybe some of these things um, aren't as important as we might think they might be. Um, but there's been a lot of kind of follow-up work to this to suggest that what we're really capturing with the important matters question might not be how important things are, but do I perceive that I have people I could talk to about important things irrespective of what I think is important, right? And that might be telling us something about like the opportunity for social support and the opportunity for kind of exchange of information or kind of things around me in a network that isn't really about the important thing at all, but it's a good proxy for kind of social closeness or social proximity to individuals and, and um, that, that might be okay that they're talking about unimportant things. Um, uh, that, there's a long debate there we could have. There's a cool series of papers I'm happy to talk about, but um, for now I'll just say um, that, that, that I'll just leave it at that. Some things that I would normally spend a lot of time talking about, but I'm just gonna kind of flip through real quick um, when we talk about um, collecting network data. How many people are you gonna, uh, are you gonna, um, uh, are, excuse me, how many nominations are you gonna allow people to have? Um, as Jim mentioned, often we ask this question in a way that is explicit. Tell me your five best friends or whatever. Um, we know that that introduces both ceiling and floor effects. If you say name five, people are gonna try and get up to five and they're rarely gonna kind of give you small numbers. And so you're gonna end up with this kind of compressed distribution sometimes when you give explicit caps. But there are reasons to do that and not. Um, I'll leave um, that debate to elsewhere, but I'll just point out it's a, it's a consideration you have to have. Um, specificity versus general relationships, this is, this is one that I tend to harp on a lot, um, is when you ask a specific name generator, you often do not know the denominator of that question. So when I've studied something like, like HIV, right, if I ask people, who have you talked to in the last four months about HIV, and then they name four people, I don't know whether those are people that they talk to every day and they happen to talk to them about HIV, or whether these are people they don't talk to about anything other than HIV and they just happen to have seen them, you know, four months ago and that's it. Right? And so being able to think about how questions, 
or relationships are nested or nested within one another or related to one another is something that we often have to kind of weigh between. And this is one of the reasons I particularly advocate for kind of multiple um, name generators in most, most surveys or most uh, research questions rather than single because then you can think about how they're related to one another as well. Questions about whether or not you're gonna um, let people just kind of name, um, other, uh, name their partners or use a roster um, has kind of trade-offs. Rosters um, tend to make, be easier to match, but they also tend to give you kind of um, more, false, more, more false positives. Free recalls are harder to match. Often they also tend to drop off over time, so I'll forget the same people that I nominated before if you just ask me to name them. As you saw earlier, I, I just, I mean, I'll forget names of my siblings at this point in time. So like it, it's, it's very possible that a free recall um, can, can lead to kind of uh, apparent change in networks that may just be a, a, um, a result of your data collection strategy, not so much that the networks have actually changed. Um, we often talk about networks as though they are ties that exist or don't. Most things, that's not accurate. Um, so being able to allow for binary um, valued um, or what Steve Borgatti refers to as nested relationships. So if you know about like a friendship, also like do you do other things with them and those sorts of things. I should add here valence ties as well as something we can collect information on because being a friend and being a not friend is not the same. It, being a friend versus being a not friend is not the same as an enemy, right? So thinking about the kind of the possibilities of some of our ties, the absence of a tie does not necessarily equate to the negative version of the same tie. And for some of the things we study, the negatives are just as important, if not more important than some of the positives that we might study as well. So other types of things you might want to factor in. Um, in longitudinal studies, something that um, has been done periodically is instead of just collecting data at waves and then comparing across them, is you can do that um, in, a, like, in a way that mimics what I just described. But then if you're at wave two and you have the previous waves with you, you could say, hey, you named so-and-so in the previous wave. Is this person still a tie? You know, are you still sharing needles with them or what have you? Um, and there, there are trade-offs that that introduces um, in, in these sorts of primings. Um, but that it's something that's worth considering uh, because a lot of times the drop off between waves is more of a matter of forgetting than it is a matter of real network change. It's something that we've observed in a number of contexts. Um, I don't know what that note's about. Um, the punchline here is, and I literally just changed that last night, so that's, yeah. Um, <laughs> the punchline here though is, Every one of these choices matters for the types of data you're going to get. Um, and so being able to pretest and interpret the likelihood of the kind of utility of your data is really important. Um, and being able to do so in ways that are relatively close to the context that you're wanting to study is important. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll give this little anecdote. So um, uh, when, when, um, uh, when I was collecting data for my dissertation a long time ago now, um, we were interested in studying kind of uh, inter-religious organizational networks um, between leaders. Um, and um, I had pre-tested the heck out of this particular instrument that we had um, in, uh, amongst, uh, amongst our research team, amongst um, some folks um, in the States. And then when we were um, fielding the data for our, our final pretest in Malawi, we learned that asking people about their kind of connections to other congregations versus to the denomination, so like the kind of local, con local church versus the kind of bigger umbrella organization, um, we couldn't get any answers to these questions. And the reason was the word for both was in Pingo. It was the same word, there was no differentiation, and it wasn't just a language problem. They really didn't, the, the, the idea of thinking about those as different forms of organizations really wasn't there. And so there was something about our research question that needed to be learned kind of in, in context. And once we got that, we figured out a way to kind of make use of that in both ways. But I just want to point out that kind of, there are things you just can't learn no matter uh, how many times you pre-test unless you do it in kind of uh, close context to what you're studying. Um, ooh. I'm gonna, what I would normally end up spending a lot of time talking about is kind of evaluation of network data. And I have, part of the reason I would spend a lot of time talking about this is this is what I've done most of and why I probably um, ended up writing books on network data collection. Um, the main thing I'll say, I'm gonna skip over it a little bit. The main thing I'll say, network data have the potential to be reported by multiple people. And so we can kind of use those as evaluations of the quality of those data. This is, paper, this is a paper with a, a former student of mine who's actually now a PhD student at UNC, um, where we looked at kind of reporting um, romantic, uh, 
uh, romantic partnerships in, in the Prosper data and predictions of kind of whether people will agree on those sorts of things. The main reason I want to mention that though is then we can think about using those agreements and disagreements not as kind of problems or nuisance in our data, but we could use them as ways to estimate the quality of, of Thai data. And that's something that Wei An has done, where basically they used disagreements as a means to estimate people's kind of um, credibility, and then they can weight the reports of ties via those credibility scores to get kind of more accurate representations of the network as a whole um, based on those kind of levels of agreement across the population, and they talk about a variety of strategies for doing so. Um, this paper by um, Stacey Torres does some of what I was talking about earlier about taking meaning of ties seriously, because um, what she refers to as elastic ties kind of basically flips on its head this notion that we have kind of strong and weak ties because her whole point is that most of our ties are strong at some times and weak at others and how we think about those um, the elasticity or the ability to kind of translate between those may tell us more about the relationships than any one of those things um, on their own and so the way we have often collected data assumes that we have some answers to this and this is uh, this is a provocation i made here last year is i think to some degree what we've done unfortunately in the network data world is that we've traded off um, prioritizing measurement precision um, at the cost of kind of fidelity to the process and i think we've often kind of um, decided that we need measures that are high quality of what we think is going to matter um, in ways that often are becoming increasingly orthogonal to the things we actually want to study. Um, and that is, I think, to our detriment. So um, this, I love her paper and that because I think it helps convince that we should be kind of returning um, to letting meaning emerge more rather than be something we assume before we start collecting data for what it's worth. I'm not gonna, yeah, I, you all have stuff on higher order networks, yes? Um, good. Um, <laughs> so I, I won't do that right now. Um, the last thing I'm gonna talk very briefly about is thinking about ethics and networks. Um, and I'm just gonna highlight a couple of really quick things. Um, ironically, I suggested we need to do this. I'm um, unfortunately still at the same place I was last year in regards to this. Sorry, Michelle. Um, uh, <laughs> we have a paper where we are um, trying to uh, get some things out to talk about um, some considerations of ethics in the network data context. The main things I'm gonna say um, these slides are available, so um, I'm not going to go in detail. The first thing I'm going to say is that consent, as we've talked about it in the U.S., is almost always thought of as an individualized thing. Um, in the network context, that doesn't really work very well, right? We're talking about relationships. Relationships don't belong to any one person. So um, if we think about what consent looks like in that context, it's going to have to take some different form. Some of the variety of possibilities here, thinking about secondary subjects types of literature, where I'm reporting on other people's information as my perception of their things. Um, it's something that you know demographers and others have done for a long time. Um, so the, 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 the point here being that um, confidentiality may not be a standard that networks either can or should achieve, uh, uh, be able to achieve. We might have to come up with other strategies that allow us to be able to do what we do in ethical ways. Um, uh, that aren't kind of trying to you know, shoehorn into um, individual level consent. There's also what's known, uh, notions of collective consent that are available out there um, that I think is another strategy for doing this. The, the, the second point that I want to make is what is often thought of as personally identifying information is one of the things that we kind of often, you know, our, our IRBs and others are kind of concerned with. But what is Personally, identifying information is often not very self-evident. And in the network context, it's even more complicated because if I tell you this is the Karate Club data, I don't know if you all have seen, but if you all haven't heard this yet, but um, um, if I tell you, it, it's a classic network data set from the 70s of a Karate Club that split, and we've seen this visualized literally thousands of times at this point in time, but if I label any one of these, if I was part of this, most of the people inside the club could tell you who everybody else is just by the single labeling, right? And so our, our kind of penchant for, for uh, visualizing, um, network, visualizing data networks can often lead to um, uh, deductive disclosure in ways that other types of data sets um, aren't constrained by. Um, and this can happen both at the kind of individual level or at the collective level. Um, the, the, um, if, you ha if you have the slides later, the um, QR code there is, um, an ethics talk that I gave here a few years ago. Um, the, the thing I want to suggest with respect to visualization, visualizations are highly valuable for us in the network world. I would argue that we should stop visualizing our true data in most of our papers. 
What we should be visualizing instead are model-based representations of our data. And what I mean by that is it's often not the exact network that you need to be able to tell your story in your paper, to be able to tell you know, how network clustering or how network homophily or how whatever matters for whatever process. What it is is those general associations between those patterns and some outcome. And so if we can take the data, model a network that has the properties that matter for your kind of actual population, present that visualization, it is coming from your results. This is what we would do in a regression paper too, right? We, we show these kind of predicted uh, out outcome lines and we do, we do things like this in all other contexts, but for some reason in the network world, we felt like we have to represent the real networks. Um, but it often comes with some big risks um, that I don't think we've wrestled with as well as we maybe ought to have. As I've mentioned previously here, um, there is a very popular network data set out there that is very restricted in who can get access to it. Um, and I wanted to do an analysis of, these, of these, these data and I did not have access to the data at the time. So I literally sat there with one of the visuals from a paper and I hand coded the data. And I, from that hand coded, I ended up publishing a paper from data that I didn't have access to because you can do that with our visualizations. Um, and there's some problems um, with what could be done. I, I don't think I did anything weird there, um, but I think that there could, there could be weird, well, weird, yes, ethical, unethical, no. Um, um, but there are plenty of things that could be done with our data when we present them in the completeness that we do that I think we have not as fully wrestled with as we maybe would. So I would argue that our visualizations would be um, just as useful for explaining the social processes we're after if we just give the model-based versions instead of the actual. But that's a side note. Um, I think I've said most, and I'm at time, so I'm going to just stop there and ask if we have any few questions. Might be a little bit off topic, but when you're deciding to collect data, how do you decide on your sample size? <laughs> sample size. Um, uh, so the the. the the, the first answer, so the question is about sample size. The first uh, question back is, are we talking about a complete network or an ego network sort of sample? So in, I mean, the, the reason I ask is in a complete network, we're usually not taking a sample. In a complete network, we're assuming that we have the population and we're usually gonna try and enumerate the entirety. Now, and I say try because almost always we can't get the entire population. And for different types of networks and different types of attributes, kind of how thorough the coverage needs to be to have a good picture of the entire population actually depends on the size of the network, right? So it's gonna, it doesn't scale, if you will. Um, it's gonna, you know, you're gonna need, you're gonna need uh, the, the amount of coverage you need depends on the size of the network. Um, if we're talking about ego networks, the, the types of things we're talking about often can be, I'll, I'll punt a little bit and say Bray is a better person to answer this question tomorrow, but to some degree, the, the things that um, answer that question in the network context aren't really that different than answer that question outside of the network context. Um, because if we assume that things are independent, which we often do when we study good networks, then we could start to make the same sampling assumptions elsewhere. So that's why um, my, my, my answer there is a little squishier, um, or actually maybe more solid, because we have you know, decades of research answering that question in that context. Please. Um, I have, so, and there's a million questions. Yeah, sorry, I was, yeah. If I have like a bunch of different ego networks, uh -huh. either from one ego, because I have several different ego yep. networks, or from several different egos, is there a best practice for integrating networks? So, at all? So, depend, I mean, the, the short answer is it depends on your population, right? Um, in some populations, it makes perfect sense to, right? So, uh, Jeff Smith, who used to be at the University of Nebraska, did some really good work on thinking about kind of in, ego, in sampled populations, how we can use those to seed and simulate kind of full populations of the, of the kind of appropriate size. Um, and this is what you would need you'd need to know kind of what the population is that those are meant to represent and whether or not the kind of connectivity that is there is kind of, and they did some work kind of calibrating when that is gonna work and when it's not gonna work. Most of our ego network, oh, not most, but a lot of ego network kind of research out there is more kind of general population survey though, right? So we're like, if we're talking about, you know, a, a state level or a, a, a country level, then those sorts of things don't make any sense. So it really depends on the scale of the population from which your ego sample is drawn on whether or not those are appropriate. And um, 
how independent they are, how related they are. Um, but Jeff's is Jeff's work is one of the Jeff Smith, who who was at the University of Nebraska. He wrote what was that SMR paper here? It was like 2013 or 2014. Um, that was kind of the beginning of, of doing some of that work. Um, I, I have a funny point on that, but I think it's beside the point for right now. Um, I'm interested in so having multiple name generators. Um, is is there is there like a best practice for the order that we are supposed to ask these questions? Because my brain goes to like people who are like name your five best friends, and then name your five enemies, and then like some people have frenemies, or you know like these like more complicated relationships or repeats. So the the questions about kind of uh, uh, multiple name generators and if there's ways to order them. Um, there's so. Uh, I threw out briefly um, uh, uh, a mention from uh, Steve Borgatti's work where he talks about relationships as potentially nestable, right? And so the idea is one thing that we want to think about when we're talking about multiple name generators is whether or not nestability like makes sense. Because sometimes when I'm talking about multiple name generators, what we're getting at are like fundamentally different things. So like the Project 90 data that I, I know you all have seen a couple of times in here had data on like sex and needle sharing, which is important for drug for, for you know disease diffusion, but it also had information on like who you share meals with. Right, so that there's something about like just more social kind of behaviors and all that to say, I think sometimes what we really want are fully kind of separate types of relationships. And in those cases, most people recommend kind of going from the more general to the more specific for a variety of reasons. Um, most of which are that they're usually subsetted in ways that that's kind of important. That said, there are ways that they can be primed, right? So um, Chris McCarty, Amber Wutich, and some others have shown that when we are responding to network um, uh, elicitations of any sort, we do it in clustered ways. We start like in one cluster, we tell you everything about that cluster before we move on to another one. So when you ask them like how many people we should be asking about partners, this five, business of like how many friends we ask about, they're like, that's way too few. They want 45. And the reason they want 45 is in, in, in there's a lot of it that's out there that kind of shows that how that gets you across these sorts of things. And that's not what your question was, I know, but, but it, there's a reason that I'm using it to answer your question is because kind of how we think about our social world is going to kind of work its way into how we answer these sorts of questions. So like the multiple name generators, if they're fully separable, I think, um, general to specific, but if they're not fully separable, right, what you're going to end up with is strong overlap across them, right? So if, if like I answered one um, and I gave you three people, if those three people have any relationship to whatever my next one is, I'm going to stick with those three people, right? And so being able to think about ways that you can kind of break out of that um, is, is also potentially kind of useful for you. And the, you hear me being fuzzy because how you break out of that is dependent on the context, right? Because you have to kind of, whatever the mental palate cleanser is for your population is gonna be different than it was for mine. Okay. Um, so I have a question about the 